Good to be here. Good to be seen and not viewed. Good to be in the land of the living, Mother. I am always struck by that singing. That was in 2015 when, on April the 3rd, um, 47 years after Dr. King stood in that same pulpit and delivered a time to break silence at Riverside Church in New York, where we chose to launch uh, the National Mall Revival. Miss Yara Allen lifted that song a cappella, and there was another video, but I, I told them to cancel it because tonight I just felt like somebody needed to hear. Somebody, I, I've tried to follow the Spirit, walk with me, and to see the unity in that moment, in that place. And at one point, that whole place just became one family, clapping together, um, standing together. Uh, and that night after that, I preached a sermon. Uh, that talked about um, moral revival uh, being a necessity for the very health, wholeness, and possibility of the nation. I want to thank all of you who've had anything to do with my being here. I got a whole list of folk. Uh, I'm scared to start calling these names because I'm going to miss somebody. Uh, if I call Steve Tolman's name, I might leave off Lisa. I leave off Lisa. I might uh, mess around not to mention Bill Fletcher. I don't want to miss the president. And, and might miss Vaughn and Minister Savina and Pamela and Dwayne and Reverend Carl. I certainly don't want to miss Unite Here, the Massachusetts Teachers Association, IBEW Local, the Teamsters, UFCW. Uh oh, I can't miss SEIU. See what I mean? See what I mean? So I'm going to go real southern and real country. What up, y'all? How about that? What up, y'all? What up? To the whole Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, and all of our friends, it's good to be here. You know, whenever God calls men and women to do anything in the name of justice, God takes the risk of putting treasure in trash, treasure in an earthen vessel, that the excellency of the power might not be of us, but, oh, God, I, I thank my brother for the introduction. But, you know, when you do all of that, there's one more piece you didn't say. They arrested me 15 times for that. <laughs> and, I, and I guess I'm kind of proud of that because the Bible says if all men speak well of you, then you're in a <laughs> terrible situation. So I've been, been arrested um, for, they call it one time emoting, just standing and refusing to move. I got arrested for praying too loud. <laughs> I got arrested for um, speaking partisan language in the legislature. But what I said was, woe unto those who legislate evil and rob the poor of their rights and make children and women their prey. That wasn't partisan. That was straight out of the Bible. Isaiah chapter 10. <laughs> and uh, so good to see Clinton and Ziggy here, our national organizers who are in this place. We, amen. We honor uh, Liz Theo Harris in her absence. I, um, when I accepted this in coming and, and, and the award tonight, I, I, I just received it on behalf of all the people here, all the folk in the campaign, uh, all the people that are unseen, all the people that are seen. Uh, I'm thankful for the award, but really, you know, it goes to the people, and I, I, I say that with deep sincerity. You know, I am... Um, I didn't know when I was, when I accepted to come, that I would go through a pretty major surgery uh, in August. Uh, I'd been sick for a year and didn't even know what was going on. I found at some point, I said, am I dying? And uh, went through some major surgery. With, with, come to find out it was a major case of gallbladder issues, 50, one of them that was the size of a, go a golf ball. And so I'm 100% better, but I'm not fully back. So I hope y'all don't mind if I, I, I know I was supposed to do some signing and things, but I got to drive three and a half hours. And one of the surgery things is they say I'm not supposed to sit but so long. So I hope y'all won't be too mad if, if after I finish, these guys here take me out the door. Because uh, I want to go to heaven, but I ain't quite ready yet. I got my ticket. You know, I got my ticket. And uh, it's fully paid. It's fully paid. 
but I ain't in no rush. <laughs> oh, hallelujah. I want to say to you uh, why we can't stay here and die. Why we can't stay here and die. Now, I want you to bear with this preacher for a minute. Uh, I'm not going to quote you the whole chapter. You can read it later. You can read it for literature. You can read it as a matter of faith. But 2 Kings chapter 6 and chapter 7. And in chapter 6, uh, it starts with a story. And I want to tell you the highlights of the story. The year was 892 B.C. The Syrian army, let me have that cane, the small one. The Syrian army, led by Ben-Hadad, was waging a siege against the capital city of Samaria in the northern kingdom of Israel. The enemy outside the city had everything they needed to beat. They had the money, they had the power, they had the weaponry. And they were prepared to keep this siege up until the people either surrendered, died of starvation, or died at the hand of the sword. It got so, it, got, it was bad. This, this, this story comes to us uh, and is passed down by the people inside the city who remember just how bad it was. It was a political, social, mental, and health pandemic of pain. It got so bad, according to the biblical text, that a donkey's head was sold for a week wages. That folk were buying the head of a donkey to try to scrape enough together to make a meal. It got so bad that dove's dung was sold for a day's wage. And folk were making soup out of dove's dung. It was so bad they wouldn't kill the dove because they needed the dove to keep producing dung. If they killed the dove, they only got to eat once. But if the dove kept producing dung, they got to eat more than once. It was so bad that mothers were killing, offering their children up to be cannibalized. And one scene in chapter 6 of, sec of King, 6 of 2 King, one mother offered her child up and she surrendered that child to, to feed the city, and then the other mother said, you do yours first and I'll do mine second, but the second mother could not bring herself to do it, and so the two mothers turned on each other. It was bad. And somebody spotted the king walking along the walls of the city, doomed in utter despair. This is how the people who survived the siege did y'all just hear that little bit of hope in there? I said, this is how the people who survive the siege. You know, there are people who have survived the siege. Some of y'all are those people who have survived the siege. Your ancestors were those who survived the siege. As bad as slavery was, as many people who were fed to the sharks that followed the ships for a free meal, across the uh, Atlantic Open where millions never got here, right? As bad as 250 years of chattel slavery was, there are people who survive the siege. As bad as it has been for people who uh, are Latino or Mexican and have bore the brunt of being hated and called illegal aliens when in fact, the people coming from Mexico are not coming to our home, they're coming to theirs that we stole from them. There are people who survive the siege. I'm one of them, I'm a Tuscaroan. There are Tuscaroans up and down the coast and other native people right here in Massachusetts. Been bad, it was great oppression, but I represent those who survive the siege. I, I think you ought to ask your neighbor beside you, are you a part of that? crowd that has survived some sieges, stuff that came at you that in terms of determined to kill you. 
things that tried to take you out, take your mind, take your hope. Is there anybody in here like that? Some of y'all looking at me. I know it ain't just the black folk. I, I, I mean, there's somebody in here. You didn't know if you would win that contract. You didn't know how you were going to feed your family. But you kept fighting, and somehow you survive the siege. But survival is not enough. You have to tell the story for succeeding generations. So they tell the story was bad for everybody. Now, two groups become the heroes during the siege. Two groups become the heroes, two essential types of people that you need, it's all right, whenever you are under attack in order to make them. The first is the prophet Elisha. I'm gonna come back to him in a minute because that you have in every dispensation of history, prophets and prophetic voices that will speak truth to power and tell the truth are necessary. Speaking truth in a time of lies is one of the most radical things you can do. Hmm? The second group of people is, uh, 2 Kings 7 says, outside the gate, while the siege were going on, there were lepers. Now, in the ancient world, to be a leper, Mr. President, was to be pushed to the side. To be a leper was, would be that 30, 40 percent that can't afford to come here unless somebody helps them. Huh? The, lepers, the lepers weren't allowed in the city even during the siege. The lepers were made to face the enemy first. They sat outside the city gates. They survived off of the pieces of the donkey's head that the others couldn't eat that was thrown off over the, over the walls. Hmm? The city gates were closed up against the enemy, but it also kept the lepers out. And in every situation in history, there are lepers. There are people that everybody ignores. Everybody is afraid of. Nobody really wants them around. And yet the people who remember this story in the seventh chapter of Kings tell that the lepers became the saviors. Hmm. Four lepers, four outcasts, four rejected people end up becoming the saviors of the city. They become the ones that stop the siege and they do it nonviolently in the text. Now, before I tell you how, let me tell you that this story makes it plain, first of all, that all this mess that people were in, that all these problems from, from the least to the greater, it wasn't the result of an enemy's assault. No, it was a result of bad leadership politically that set the city up to be sieged before the siege ever happened. There was a king, a politician, who would not listen to the voices of the prophets, like Joe Manchin, who now wants to be y'all savior. Oh, I ain't scared. How are you gonna offer himself to mobilize the middle when he wouldn't even vote for living wages? How's he gonna offer himself to be mobilized the middle and run for president when he won't even take care of the poor people in West Virginia. Sometimes because I've had surgery and I've got pain, I, wouldn't, I say what I wouldn't say normally if I didn't have pain. He need to sit his ass down. I, that's the pain speaking. That that. Mobilize what middle? He won't even take sludge from coal that's killing West Virginians. I've been there, his plants poison the water. Way away from the cameras, way up where most people don't go. How you gonna mobilize the middle? When you wouldn't even vote for healthcare. When you told John Lewis before he died, 
I support your voting rights bill and signed on to it as a co-author, but when the Chamber of Commerce called you and called in their money, you went, you reneged on your promise to John Lewis on his deathbed and your lie that you told to West Virginians that you would, would be for living wage if you ever got the chance. What I'm trying to say is, whenever the sieges happen in life, it's because in culture, it does matter who's in office. And we better make sure we don't let these robots on, on social media tell us don't vote. We better be sure we don't get uh, become purists and, and, and if we disagree with one person, we say we're not gonna vote for them. Well, who are you gonna vote for? If, I'm not telling you who to vote for, but if it's Trump and Biden, who are you really gonna vote for? I'm just saying. Because it does matter. Hmm? Sometimes you have to elect somebody that at least won't make it, as my grandma said, what's up? <laughs> it might not do everything you want, but at least they won't make it what's up. <laughs> the story in 2 Kings says all of this happened because of a bad king. And, 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 and we see this today. Elect leadership that, for lack of a better phraseology, that's just mean, unjust, evil. I don't even call people Democrat or Republican anymore. I look at their policies. If your policies hurt the least of these, if your policies won't lift up those who are in need, then it's just mean. It's just unjust. It's just evil. Isaiah 10, we're one of those who legislate evil. It doesn't say who legislate, just some different kind of way of considering public policy. It says legislate evil. And how do you legislate evil? Whenever you rob poor folk of their rights. Whenever you make women subject to your whims. That's what the Bible said. Whenever you hurt children, it's evil. It's unjust. It's just wrong. Hmm? But what do you do you know, what do you call it when, when folk suppress the vote? And you know, suppression of the vote is, is a curious thing because, see, it started out, the suppression of the vote was they suppressed women's right to vote. They suppressed white men who didn't have any land's right to vote. And then they suppressed black folk and everybody else's right to vote, right? And, 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 but you know, when you suppress the vote, it's really more than a political issue. It's actually a theological issue. Yeah, let, let me tell you what I mean. You see, in this country, we only give the right to vote to people. We don't give the right to vote to puppies, parakeets, and pets. Only people that get, they gotta, you, you gotta be a people, a person. You gotta be 18 years or older, born or naturalized in these United States. So if I suppress your right to vote in any form, I'm saying you're not a people. You're not a person. That means I'm playing God now. It's not just about partisan stuff. It's, 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 about, it's about deep moral issues. Huh? See, your right to vote didn't come from a constitution. It came from God. God. If, if you follow the biblical story, the biblical story says that the difference between humanity and the rest of nature is that humanity was created with the right to, with the ability to vote, the ability to make a choice. That's why in the Hebrew Bible, the, ver the word for voice and the word for vote is the same word, call, Q-U-L, call. That's what it means, to lift your voice or to lift your voice or your vote. And so anybody suppressing the vote in any kind of way, not just for black folk, but for anybody, it is a politician suggesting that you are not human. And that's why if you don't fight it, then you become an accessory to the crime of demeaning other people's humanity. It's mean. And whenever politicians are mean, unjust, and just acting evil, psychologically, politically, and physically, the country is under siege. 2 Kings 7, the nation was under siege. Siege, everything blocking, blocking food, blocking protection, blocking help. 
and the leadership used its power, which is one of the worst forms of, of political malpractice. When you get up in the morning and all you can think to do is, with your power is hurt somebody. That's a sick person. You get up in the morning, you elected to Congress, you got free health care because you got elected, but then you don't want your constituents to have what you have. That's just, that's just sick. That's, it's, So they're under siege. Siege in this text means not just the politics of meanness, but necropolitics, the politics of death. Bad public policy kills. Let me say that again. In the 18th century, there was a, a um, economist and social writer who coined the frame policy murder. And when he looked at what was happening in England and saw how many people were dying from it, he said you could no longer just call it bad policy. You had to name. He said, and it's not policy manslaughter. It would only be manslaughter if the politician didn't know the results of their decision. But when you know the results of your decision, it's policy murder. I, I got right quiet, but that's good. So from this standpoint, this story from 800 and something BC has relevancy today because America is under siege from politicians who are using their power to hurt the nation and produce policy murder. America is under siege not just from the politicians, but from movements of regression. And if you, if you do a deep examination of the policies that they put in place, Though the policies are necropolitics, the policies of death. Poverty right now in this country, in the 21st century, the richest nation in the world is the fourth leading cause of death. Poverty in America. That's why uh, Matthew Desmond wrote a book called Poverty by America. He, he, he first wrote Poverty in America, then he had to correct himself. He said, no, it's not poverty in America. That would be the suggestion. The poverty in America is just like every other nation. He said, no, the poverty here is a particular kind of poverty amidst so much affluence and wealth. And, he, and they did the numbers and found out that poverty kills more people than police violence, diabetes, respiratory disease, and several other major diseases, poverty. Just, in other words, in truth of the matter, we should be putting a surgical, Surgeon General's warning on a low-wage job. And if we don't start talking like this, we're never going to force the kind of consciousness that, that we need to shift the narrative and the change in this country. We're going to have to start naming some folk and say, when you block living wages, when you block health care, you are engaging in policy murder. That's why a group of pastors that I'm with, we've told people, if you invite us to preach your family member's eulogy and they died from the lack of health care, we ask the people the permission to allow us to do what Emmett Till's mama did. Open the casket call the cameras in, and we will not anymore, I, I had to repent of this sin, standing over people dead in churches and lying and saying God called them home, and God didn't have a damn thing to do with it. God may have welcomed them home, God may have embraced them home, but they were killed by policies. Fifty million people in this country right now are poor and are low-wage workers make less than $15 an hour in the wealthiest country in the world. And you know what the, num the first agenda item on the March on Washington was? It wasn't voting rights. It wasn't singing We Shall Overcome. It wasn't come by y'all. The first agenda item that Bayard Rustin, who was gay and who was a labor man, made sure was on the agenda was raising the minimum wage by 75% and indexing it with. We are 60 years from the March on Washington, that still hasn't happened, and we had a remembrance of some so-called remembrance of the March on Washington in August, and it wasn't even mentioned. So even sometimes the way we are remembering our own history, we become accessories to the crime of murder. 
Because when we go to D.C. to so-called remember the march on Washington and don't even talk about living wages, which was the first agenda, and everybody, every able-bodied man and woman having a federal job, that was the second agenda, and expanding the Federal Labor Standard Act, that, that the third agenda, and voting rights, the fourth agenda, and we go there to think all that happened at the march on Washington was one speech, and you talk about the last part, I have a dream, not the real speech, which was normalcy never again. That was the real title. And we don't lift up what John Lewis said when he criticized the Kennedy administration and said the current 1964 bill would not help my white friends or my black friends who were suffering. If we go there and act nostalgic like that all that happened was a black march when it wasn't a black march, it was a union march, it was a unified march, it was a solidarity march, it was for jobs and freedom. If we don't tell it right, then we participate. We're under siege. Voting rights is under siege. More than a thousand voter suppression bills have been pushed in state houses uh, since the election of Obama. It wasn't about Obama, it was about the, the coalition that broke through in the South. And, and, and once that coalition voted, all of a sudden voter fraud became the language. In other words, when, when black folk and white folk and Latinos vote together, it's got to be fraud. Huh? Healthcare, we're under siege. 87 million people today in America either underinsured or uninsured. 87 million people. We spend more money on any other nation in health care. We're the, we're the only of the 25 wealthiest countries that makes health care a matter of your job and not your humanity. That's policy murder. And we came through a pandemic and still couldn't change. 350,000 people died during COVID, not from COVID, but from the lack of health care. One family in the Poor People's Campaign, one young lady lost 25 members of her family in a 30 mile radius in Mississippi. In my state, one family lost 38 members of their family in a, in, a, in, a, in a 20 mile radius because the state refused to accept Medicaid expansion and closed all the hospitals within 30 minutes of that community. Those folk didn't die from COVID. They didn't die from a pandemic called COVID. They died from a pandemic called political malpractice and meanness and greed. And even in the face of a million people, even some Democratic senators and Republicans and, and Housemans couldn't let go the tit, if y'all from the South, of pharmaceutical and the healthcare industry. They would rather nurse on that tit and the money that comes out of it than in a pandemic to save lives. Murder. Murder. And I know everything is fine in Mississippi, I mean in Massachusetts. I know, I know, I'm, this stuff I'm talking about had nothing to do with Massachusetts. The fact that 30 to 40 million people in America were at the risk of eviction during the pandemic. And you know what our solution was? We will forgive you three weeks, three months, but in the fourth month, you got to pay back the three months and the fourth month. I, I know Massachusetts is fine. But even in this state, there are 2.3 million poor and low income people in Massachusetts. 34% of your population is poor and or low wealth. In Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, it would take two adults and two children need to make $32 an hour to survive. That's $25 more than the national minimum wage. The current minimum wage in Massachusetts is $15 an hour, but in order to basically meet it, you got to work 111 hours a week just to afford a basic modest bedroom, house, or apartment in Massachusetts. There are over 700,000 people, 19% of the workforce that earn less than $15 an hour. 
584,000 adults, 15% of, of, of Asians and Native workers, 31% of black workers, 40% of Hispanic workers, 15% of white workers, 24% of women, and 38% of women of color. Now, but in raw numbers, mostly white workers. In percentage, black and black for women are higher. But in, in raw numbers, mostly white. In Massachusetts. In Massachusetts, in 2022, a million people relied on expanded SNAP. That's food stamps. However, in 2023, the SNAP ben benefits were reduced by 90 to $250 a month, cutting them down to $6 a day. So 635,000 plus people are impacted by these cuts in Massachusetts. 2023, there were more than one year after the eviction, 269,000 plus households in Massachusetts report being behind on their rent. During the most intense period of Massachusetts, 165,000 people were uninsured. And with the ending of continuous eligibility on Medicaid, 365,000 people are estimated to lose their health care between 2019 and 2020 in Ma Massachusetts experienced a 1.4 year decline in life. So why can't we die yet? Because we got work to do. And every one of us that have so far made it through COVID ought to ask this question, why? Because you ain't here because you're better than somebody else, you know? All of us only got six minutes of life, really. You stop breathing for six minutes and see what happens. Huh? I'm not talking about six minutes, Dougie Fresh on the dance floor, neither. I'm talking. <laughs> six minutes. And the real question is not, why are you still here, but what are you going to do? What are we going to do like these lepers? If we're still alive, what is our job to stop this death? <clears throat> So in the story, we learn, first of all, <clears throat> in every situation of siege, you got to have moral prophetic voices. In this text, Elisha was the moral prophetic voice. There have been different ones. Um, the other day when the UAW president started talking about Jesus would be with the, with the worker, that was a moral prophetic voice. People got mad with him, but it was the truth. Jesus was a worker. Jesus would, would say the, the, the uh, laborers worthy of his hire, right? When Pope Francis says that... Um, 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 trickle down economics and uh, um, what's the other one? Trickle down economics uh, is a form of evil. He's being prophetic. When he says that an economist that says just take care of the middle class and everybody else, he's, he's, he's being prophetic. He's being prophetic. So every age needs prophetic voices. Every age needs moral prophetic leaders that will stand up and bring hope, but not false optimism. It's got to be a hope that comes through the despair, which means it has to honestly face the despair and call it out and call it what it is. You know, Frederick Douglass, there's a story about Frederick that I always tell. Frederick Douglass got broken, y'all, in, 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 in um, April of 1857. <laughs> the Supreme Court that had been set up and they put Justice Taney on the court and they passed and they voted on the, um, they voted on the Dred Scott decision and basically said a white black man had no rights that a white person ever had to pay attention to. And it basically, most of the abolition movement thought it was over, including Frederick, said this is over, there's nothing we're gonna be able to do now. And the story says that Frederick Douglass got depressed and his, his friend Harriet Tubman saw him one day with his head in his hands, depressed, crying, giving up. The great Frederick Douglass. Because you can get tired out here. I wish I had a witness. Huh? If, if you haven't got tired, you haven't really fought against injustice. You've just been playing around the edges. Huh? The only, only reason you haven't got tired is because all you cared about was your labor contract, and once you got it, you didn't give uh, about nobody else. But if you really are in the fight for justice and humanity, you can get tired out here. And Frederick Douglass got tired. 
And Harriet Tubman came in the room and saw her friend sitting over there with his head in his hand, and she asked him a question that he said shook his very soul. Frederick, is God dead? Frederick said it shook him. And he accepted an invitation to the American Abolition Society two months after the Dred Scott decision. Listen at the prophet. But as with David and Goliath, oppression as organized as ours will appear invincible up until the hour of its fall. The Supreme Court of the United States is not the only power in the world. It is very great, but the Supreme Court of the Almighty is greater. Justice Taney can do many things, but he cannot perform impossibilities. He cannot change the essential nature of things, and he cannot make evil good and good evil. Such a decision by this court cannot stand. God will be true, though every man be a liar. We can appeal from this hell black judgment of the Supreme Court to the court of common sense and the common humanity, and we can appeal from man to God. If there's no justice on earth, there is yet justice in heaven. You may close your Supreme Court against the black man's cry for justice, but you cannot, thank God, close against him the ear of a sympathizing world, nor shut up the courts of heaven. All that is merciful, all that is just, all, all, all on earth and in heaven will execrate and despise this edict of Tanner. And so, my friends, as monstrous as it appears, we can meet this decision with a cheerful spirit. This very attempt to blot out forever the hopes of an enslaved people may be one necessary link in the chain of events preparatory to the downfall and complete overthrow of the whole system of slavery. The whole history of the anti-slavery movement is studied with proof that all measures devised and executed with a, with a view to ally and diminish the anti-slavery agitation has only served to do one thing. Every time you try to stop us, you only increase, intensify, and embolden our agitation. That's prophetic speaking. That's Frederick Douglass. After Harriet Tubman said, Frederick, is God dead? God always has an Elisha. And today, you are being called to be the Elishas, the messengers of truth, the messengers of light, the messengers of hope. But not only does God have Elishas in every moment of siege, God also has some wounded healers. At the gate of the city, at the gate of the city, at the gate of the city, there were four lepers, four outcasts, four men who were living in the midst of dismal life, unimaginable. They were poor, they were powerless, they were not permitted to go to the city, they were afraid. They were stuck. But how many of you know sometimes the place where you think you're stuck is actually the place where you've been set to make a difference? Hmm? You can't really conceive a more miserable situation than these four men. Nothing to do, nowhere to go. They were four men dying at the gate. They had no family, no food, no business, no obligation, no responsibilities. Can you imagine four lepers? four of them. Why is this happening to us? What have we done to deserve this? And then one of the lepers in the midst of the struggle said, why are we sitting here until we die? That's a question. It's an existential question. It's a faith question. It's an organizing question. Then some, another leper flipped it over. Will we sit here? until we die. And these four wounded healers teach us three things that I'm through that we need to hear today. Number one, these lepers show us 
what nonviolent leadership looks like. There are times when those who suffer must become the deliverers. But you cannot fight with the weapons of the monsters you defy lest you become the monster. Hmm? It was slaves, lepers, who saved this nation. It was workers who fought for a fair and just economy. It was college students who could not vote themselves, and nevertheless, they risked their lives and went south from the north to fight for voting rights. And they didn't even have voting rights until the Supreme Court in the 1970s allowed 18-year-olds to vote. One writer, as I said, calls this wounded here. The psalmist says it like this. There comes a time when the stone that the builders rejected become the chief cornerstone of a new reality. Number two, the lepers teach us that there comes a time you got to vote to live when other folk are voting for you to die. If it ain't before of you, if it's just your local, if it's nobody but your group, you got to vote yourself to live. I'm not going to just sit here and die. If I die, I'm going to put up a fight. If I die, I'm at least going to die standing. I'm at least going to die with my mouth open. I'm at least going to die speaking the truth. But I'm not just going to sit here and die. Hmm? They teach us that. You got to vote in a time of utter destruction that you will not only not participate in the destruction, you will defy it. Number three, they teach us that solidarity is the only way. Notice in the text the four lepers don't go off individually. They don't each go in their silos. See, we don't know how they became lepers. You could come become a leper from, in, you could um, contract it. You could um, be born with it. But, but they don't separate their pain. They unite it. And, and, and ought we not learn that lesson now? You, you know that the same people who are against public education are often, most often, the same ones against gay folk. And the same folk that are against gay and LGBTQ folk are against labor unions. Check their record. And the same ones that vote against labor unions vote against uh, uh, health care. And the same ones that vote against health care vote against fixing the climate. And the same ones that vote against fixing the climate tend to vote against trans people. And the same ones that vote against trans people vote against a living wage. So if they cynical enough to be together, we better be smart enough to come together. These lepers say, when death is in the land, you don't, silos are good, I get that. There are times for silos, but there are times when your silo is only gonna get you hurt worse. You better bring your silo together with everybody else that is having. I said this the other day, I was down in Texas, and I said, I, there's some, I, I met a guy, I said I had a problem because I met somebody who was gay and racist, and I just couldn't figure it out. How you gonna be gay and racist? Huh? You know? How you gonna be pro-labor and you ain't pro-voting rights? You, you hear what I'm saying? It doesn't make sense, because the same folk Politically, that are after one or after the other. Huh? That's why right now, don't you, don't, you know, the news isn't showing enough of it. You notice how in this struggle in Israel and Gaza right now, the real power is to see Palestinians that are speaking out against Hamas and Jewish folk that are speaking out against Netanyahu and Christians who are standing together with all of them saying, wait a minute, wait a minute. We believe in the imago dei of all persons that every person is created in the image of God. And so whether it's what Hamas did on the 7th or what is the Israeli government, Netanyahu, not the people, the government that Netanyahu is doing now, when you kill babies and children and elders and sick folk, it doesn't matter if you do it under the name of liberation or national security, it's wrong. And what's happening is folk are coming together. In fact, that's where I am now. I'm not going to any more rallies unless it's Jews, Palestinians, uh, Muslims, and Christians all together. Because there comes a time. You can't let this, 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 this stuff separate us. 
You got to find people of goodwill in every situation who will challenge evil no matter where it comes from and who are decided that everybody has a right to live, especially those on the margins. With all this lying, we better get together with all this racism. We better get together with all this failure and hatred and injustice and denial of basic human rights. We better get together. We better stand together. We better vote together. We better speak up together. We better hold one another together. We better pray for one another together. We better love one another together because at the end of the day, evil will take us all out if good doesn't come together. I'm almost through, but that's why on March the 2nd of next year, 35 weeks before the elections in November, the Poor People's Campaign, the National Call for Moral Revival, is calling for 30 state capital mass moral marches uh, of poor and low-wage people on the state capitals. Mass moral marches around seven issues that unite us all. Mass moral marches on state capitals and to the poor. Can you imagine if we can pull that off together? Can you imagine if, if there's a march at the capital of Massachusetts and the same time North Carolina and the same time South Carolina? Can't you imagine? Interruption on CNN, something going on. Uh, I see the people coming together of all different races and creeds and colors. Now, wait, wait a minute. We just heard they're in Massachusetts. Wait a minute. Another group just broke out in Nebraska. Wait a minute. There's somebody in Indiana. What's going on? Oh, it's poor people. It's low-wage folk. It's their advocates. It's moral religious leaders. The preachers got on their stoles. The, the rabbis got on their shawls. And the Muslims got on their hats. And everybody is coming together saying, you will not kill us and we will not die. Because this year, next year, we don't need a political vote. We need a movement vote. A vote that changes everything. I hope you'll join. And I'll close with this. Visualize these four men sitting on the breath of death and saying, the enemy may kill us, but at least we're going to try. They voted unanimously. We can't just stay here and die. We got to use our voices and our bodies. They unite and they start walking toward the enemy. United. They started walking galvanized. They started walking. And imagine there are 80 million, so 80 plus million poor low income voters. 63 million are, are, are eligible to vote and registered. But in the last few elections, only 27 million voted. 39 million vote. There's not a state in this country where poor and low wealth people don't make up 30% of the electorate. In most big battleground states, it's 40% of the electorate. There's not a state in this country where if 20% of low, poor and low wealth voters who have not voted in the last two elections, but when they did vote, they voted progressive, would vote now that they could not shift every election in every state in the country. But if you have power and don't use it, if you have power and don't unite it, then you become an enabler of that which is trying to defeat you. These lepers move. And when they moved, it's almost like God was waiting to see if they would move. Because when they moved, God amplified their limping. God, the Bible says he turned their dragging into drum beats. He, he, he turned their deep, hard breathing into the sound of an army. And the enemy said, there's an army coming. And we better run. It was just lepers. But when the lepers got together and God anointed the lepers, God made them sound like a mighty. Can you hear them? Can you see them? Clothed in rags, full of sores and sickness, no strength, but still determined to live. And they end up, the lepers end up emancipating the whole nation. The very ones that were seen to be the sickest and the illest and the worst off, when they came together and refused to die, they ended up saving the whole nation. When they voted not to stay where they were, they ended up saving 
the nation. And so the third thing they teach us is that solidarity, ain't that a union word? Is the only way. I know I've been too long, but there comes a time when the rejected have to come together. There comes a time when solidarity is the only way. There comes a time when we got to ask the question that that white East Kentucky mine worker's wife asked in the 1920s when they came looking to arrest her husband. She started singing, which side are you on, my brother? Which side are you on? And somebody shouted, I'm on the freedom side. I'm on the justice side. Huh? And think about it. What would happen if all the people affected by racism and Islamophobia and anti-Semitism and homophobia and low-wage workers and, and low wages and health care come together? What happened if the Palestinians who don't like Hamas, what Hamas is doing to Jews and the Jews that don't like what Netanyahu is doing would come together? The story says that when the lepers come together, that's when power comes. My brothers, the soul of our nation cannot be saved. It cannot be sturdy. It cannot be properly put together unless the rejected lead the revival. You are among the rejected. Because you're the ones that every so often you got to fight just for basic needs as a union. You are among the jet. And this moral revival only happens when we come together. And here's the final piece. Can I preach for a minute like I would off home? We got a good record that it works. When Moses and the women, the Hebrew women, and Shipra and Pura and his rod got together, Pharaoh came down and the Red Sea opened up. Uh, when Esther and her uncle Mordecai came together, and Esther said, if I perish, I perish, but I'm going to see the king. Change happened. When David was overlooked by Samuel and his daddy, but he came together, with five rocks and his slingshot. We found out the next morning that when you come together, the bigger they are, the harder they fall. When three Hebrew children came together, Shadrach, Meshach, and a bad Negro, and they went in the fiery furnace, they found out that when you come together, God will make a pre-visitation and come in the fire with you, and you won't even smell like what you've been through. The truth is, when we come together, justice has never lost. I wish I had a witness. Now, I didn't say justice hadn't been fought. I didn't say justice hadn't been beat down. But when we come together, justice has never lost. During slavery, it looked like justice had lost. But when rejected folk like Harriet Tubman and Frederick Douglass and white Quakers and white evangelicals like William Lord Garrison, when they all came together, fought for abolition, they brought slavery down. When women were rejected and didn't have the right to vote, Elizabeth Cady Staten hooked up with Sojourner Truth and Lucretia Mott, and they won the right to vote. Plessy versus Ferguson, the Supreme Court decision that codified Jim Crow and segregation. It looked like it had won. When, when Charles Hamilton Houston connected to the descent of Justice Harlan, a white justice from East Kentucky, and when he then trained Thurgood Marshall, and Thurgood Marshall got together with white lawyers and black lawyers and Jewish lawyers and Christian lawyers, they went before the Supreme Court. One of the members was a former Grand Wizard of the KKK. But when they were together, even he had to vote unanimously that Jim Crow was contrary to the Constitution. It looked like it looked like the rules of segregation had beaten down justice. But when Rosa Parks rejected, came and Martin Luther King came from rejected people, and Rabbi Heschel, a rejected Jew, and Bayard Rustin, a rejected because he was gay, and James Reed rejected because he was a race trader and a Unitarian, and Viola Russo because she was a white woman willing to stand with black people when they all got together. They brought segregation down. Apartheid in South Africa looked invincible. But when Nelson Mandela, who was from the rejected, got together with rejected mothers from South Africa and got together with Bishop Tutu at the Anglican Church and then Peter Story, a white Methodist minister, when they all got together, 
they brought apartheid down. In North Carolina, they said we would lose, but when we built Mall Monday and we all got together, they spent $6 million against us fighting a bad voter suppression law, but four years later, we won, and the court said it wasn't nothing but surgical, surgical racism. There's a power biblically. There's a power historically. I know it biblically. I know it historically, but I want to tell you, I know the power of coming together and why you just can't die. You got to fight to live because of my own life. Several years ago, I felt rejected. I was rejected. I was told I'd never walk again. I'd always put a lot of hope in my legs. I used to lift 650 pounds leg weights. But I was told I'd never get out of wheelchair, 29 years old, might as well go ahead and get a nursing home. Preachers came and told me, you might as well quit pastor. Nobody wants a crippled pastor. Oh, yes, they did. Came to my bedside, said that kind of foolishness to me. You might well figure something else because nobody is going to want a crippled pastor. I woke up one morning, I couldn't move. I went into depression. I know what it's like that if somebody would offer you some heroin, you just might take it because the pain is so bad. I know what it's like to think about putting a bullet to your head and it'd be better to, let me say it might be better to leave here. I was there one night and a woman came in my room. She was an amputee. She came in and said, son, I heard you in here depressed. I said, woman, if you don't get out of my room, leave me alone. She said, well, you can't go nowhere. You can't run, and I'm going to talk to you. She said, now nah, I'm an amputee. They're going to give me some legs, but I'm not going to use them long because I'm getting ready to go to heaven to get my brand new leg. But you got work to do. You got to decide you're not going to die. You got to get over of your vanity. You worried more about people seeing you cripple than you are about God using you cripple. You worried about the wrong thing, and you might as well get over it and stop sitting here, and she said, I'm going to pray for you. And she did, she prayed, and I cried, and in the middle of the night, something touched me, and I got up the next morning, sitting on the side of the bed in pain, but sitting there, the nurse came in and said, what's going on? I said, I'm ready to fight, I'm ready to fight. I may never be able to walk like I once was. I may never be able to run to 40 again in 5.2 seconds, but I'm, I got to fight. And she, I said, but I do want you to go get this woman. She said, what's her name? I said, Miss Watson. She said, okay. She went down, checked. Said, There's no Miss Watson on this floor. I said, there got to be a Miss Watson on this floor because Miss Watson came in to visit me. Doctors came in looking at me funny. I said, why are y'all in here? They said, you okay? Are you losing it? Are you, are you? I said, no, no. Is it depression? They started, brought the psychologist. I said, there's Miss Watson here. They said, no, it wasn't. There's nobody Watson like that in the whole hospital. I said, okay. Thank you, God, for sending me an amputated angel. Thank you, God, for sending me just what I needed, a wounded healer. I spent three months in a hospital bed at UNC, not knowing if I'd ever get up again. After we got out, I came out on a wheelchair and on a walker. Every time I stood to preach, it felt like when I got up, somebody had a butcher knife in my hip. The only time I didn't hurt was while I was preaching, which is why I preached so long. For 12 years, I was in a wheelchair for 12 years. I was on a walker for 12 years, for 12 years. But over those 12 years, my mind got together. My doctors got together. My swim coach got together. My nurses got together. My, my, my therapists got together. My pharmacists got together. The prayer warriors got together. My family got together. And I can hop now. <laughs> I can stand now. I ain't ashamed to have no cane anymore. It's all right if you reject it. As long as you're fighting, as long as you're standing. When we all got together, I was able to come and be with you. Aren't you glad that when we get together, God can do some marvelous thing? And I'm telling you now, in the name of the God of love, the rejected must lead the movement in this country. I need you. Do you know what it's like to be rejected because of your sexuality? Come up here, just one of you. Do you know what it's like to be rejected because you're a low-wage worker? Come up here with me. Do you know what it's like to be rejected because of your age and they tell you, you ain't got nothing else you can do? Would you come up here? Do you know what it's like to be rejected because you're Muslim? Would you come up here? Do you know what it's like to be rejected because you're Jewish? Would you come up here? Do you know what it's like to be rejected because you're trans? Would you come up here? Do you know what it's like to be rejected because of the way you wear your hair, because of who you love, 
because of how much money you have, uh, how sick you are. Stand up here and turn and look at the folk because this is what's going to change this country. Turn and look at them. Look at them. Turn. Y'all look around. Come on. If you're rejected, come up here. I know somebody else feels rejected. Come on up here if you've been rejected. Come on up here. You were the first one to graduate. There were some folk that said folk like you would never be a chancellor. You better come on up here. You know they talked about you. Who are you in here? Who are you in here? When the rejected come together, we can win health care. When the rejected come together, we can win living wages. When the rejected come together, we can save our children. When the rejected come together, we can lift the people. We can love the people. We can bless the people. We can move the people. We can vote the people. We can stand the people. If we come together, is there anybody in here ready to see a revival in America? Would you look at your neighbor and say, neighbor, you better come on here with your rejected self and decide we will not die. Labor will not die. The fight for justice will not die. We will live.